All right. I think that makes everybody happy that we're to item number R7. Uh, I will make the obvious acknowledgement uh, that I am aware of. This is a record attendance for the Shasta County Board of Supervisors, at least in my tenure on the board. <laughs> So let me go ahead and uh, outline a process for item number R7 so we can all be on the same page and understand what it is that we are doing this morning. Um, R7 is a discussion to receive input and discuss matters regarding geoengineering chemtrails, consider providing direction to staff, and consider taking other appropriate action as necessary. In a few moments, I'm going to go ahead and turn this over to Supervisor Giacomini to introduce her uh, guest speaker today. What we have is we have, um, we have a presentation that has been arranged in advance through Supervisor Giacomini who placed this item on today's agenda. In addition to that, there are a number of speakers that had been arranged through Supervisor Giacomini to also join with that first presentation in order so that they might be grouped and clustered together. We're going to honor that request and take them as you had asked for in advance and agreed to Supervisor Giacomini. After that, there are a lot of requests. In fact, uh, uh, a lot. It's a lot, <laughs> uh, as I'm sure that you recognize. We're going to take those in the order received today, okay? I'll proceed as quickly as I can now. So we have the issue of climate engineering and semantics are important. The, too much at media and other officials, not saying this board, they've been very courteous, but have not used the scientific terms and this is, this is not used for a reason because uh, the, the term chemtrails is not a scientific term, so we try to avoid those terms. But when you see CBS News, geoengineering to fight, glo fight global warming is now mainstream topic conversation with all scientific organizations and with governmental officials, such as John Holdren, Obama's science advisor, who is actively advocating for the use of geoengineering. And again, this is, these are aspects that media does not cover because this would legitimize this issue. This would bring credibility to it. So we do have, again, science data that's it's too extensive to document here, but when we have current administration officials advocating for these programs and the immediate need to implement these programs, this subject should not be marginalized as it typically is by media. When we have, this is, this is from MIT, this diagram is from MIT where you clearly see an aircraft spraying particulates out the back. Now, again, this is mainstream scientific discussion. We have every major science institution talking about these issues right now, that, that these programs must be implemented. And so again, when, what we ask is that this issue be given attention. And our point here today, irregardless of where the contamination is coming from over Shasta County and the rest of the globe, we ask that the science be looked at and, and that the legitimacy of this issue be acknowledged with the science terms, that this is brought to public attention and brought into a public dialogue. This is, again, only the tip of the iceberg for what's available for documentation. This is a 40-page congressional research document, geoengineering governance and technology. There's a, a number of documents like this. We have, even going back to the 60s, for example, we have 80-page presidential documents outlining the scope and scale of these programs even back that far. We see skies like this. Certainly, we have a lot of people telling us this is normal commercial traffic. That, it's, it's, <laughs> that this, is, this is normal and, and that this is just random flights flying wherever they fly and that this stuff sticks in the air. But if this is random, that's not so random. Do we think the commercial aircraft fly in grid patterns? Again, the data is absolutely there, but we have major agencies telling us that this isn't so. In fact, there's, there's uh, a NASA document that says chemtrails aren't real. But again, they use a term that's not scientific on purpose. And at the same time, we have patents from NASA for geoengineering. So uh, there's... There's been a, a tremendous effort to try to marginalize an issue that's tremendously impactful for all of us, equally impactful. And I, I, I certainly don't see the board as adversarial to us. I mean, I'm very grateful that we've been allowed to speak here and bring this issue up to light. And, and for our point, I think acknowledgement and disclosure is due for, in this case, for local agencies, the contamination issue. Because I've spoken in front of California 
Air Resources Board. I've spoken in front of the California Energy Commission. And it seems that all these agencies are unwilling to, to look at this issue. And at this point, there are certain factors that can't be denied. And contamination is one of those factors. So we have NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, admitting on the record that the atmosphere is now full of particulates and they don't know where they're coming from. So this is, this is quite astounding when you have the agency that's supposed to study this issue that's, that's literally um, unable to identify the source. When I spoke in front of the California Energy Commission in Sacramento, they acknowledged the state was losing 20 to 40 percent of its rainfall from, quote, particulates of unknown origin. But that investigation was never followed through. Uh, there's an investigation going right now with state water quality. I spoke to that representative. Their fishing game has acknowledged that there's aluminum running down the waterways. I spoke to the representative with uh, California State Water Quality who made it clear that they were not going to test the rainfall for this contamination. But isn't that where runoff comes from? So again, we have uh, an unwillingness to look at the obvious sources. This is a satellite image. It's a little foggy, but if you look closely in the the bottom left quadrant, you can see aircraft trails blanket spraying the Pacific. This is visible on satellite imagery every single day. These silvery white skies we see are particulates blowing in from the coastal regions, and we have patents request or, or the, stating the dire need to enhance the marine layer to try to deflect some of the sun's incoming thermal energy. It's called solar radiation management. So. When we have satellite imagery of this happening, and planes flying in, in loops and grids, and we have this material blowing in on us, it's coming from somewhere, and CARB, this is important. We know this metal's falling on us. We have, I furnished you guys today with about 40 lab tests uh, from the state certified lab showing a very, very substantial amount of metal. And again, aluminum does not exist in the environment in free form. That's important to remember because a lot of agencies try to say it's a common element, we should expect it. This is not the case. It doesn't exist in free form. So it's coming from somewhere and CARB has told us it is not coming from China. So we know it's a more local origin. Now, we have a UV issue. This is another matter of disclosure for the board. We have a known, verifiable, indisputable contamination issue. And we know the board can't stop this. Nobody here expects that. We know that's far beyond the scope of the board, but we do have a contamination issue that's a danger to the citizens. So what we're asking, what I'm asking, is disclosure of this contamination, and we also have a very, very dangerous UV level. The bark is being burned off of trees in town. We're metering this UV with state-of-the-art meters. We're seeing UVB levels 1,200% higher than we're being told. And this is a government document, National Science Foundation, acknowledging that injecting sulfate particles, which is geoengineering, stratospheric aerosol geoengineering, will decimate the ozone layer, destroying from one quarter to three quarters of the ozone layer. So this is very significant, and this goes hand in hand with what we see. Uh, again, article, unprecedented ozone hole opens up over the Canadian Arctic. We have very substantial northern hemisphere ozone depletion. Ozone depletion over even northern California is very substantial. We're seeing very dangerous UV levels. We're simply asking that that be disclosed. That's all. So uh, again, it's, it, this is a public health issue that we believe is necessary to disclose. This is a headline from a week ago. Blazing World record strongest UV rays ever measured on Earth. Many of you are familiar with the UV reading, a rating of 10 or 11 is considered extreme. NASA has just recorded, in fact, this is 11 years old. I don't know why it took 11 years for them to disclose this. Readings of 43. 43 is absolutely lethal to be outside. I mean, it's very dangerous to be exposed to that. So again, we have very high readings here. We're asking for that to be disclosed. Health effects of UV radiation. The list is much longer than what it shows here, but we're seeing everything we would expect to go along with this exposure going off the charts. So uh, again, this, this comes down to a recognition of what's going on in our skies, and more importantly, where this board is concerned, an investigation and disclosure of the contamination and UV issue, which again is a public health hazard. These are trees in our local parking lots here. The bark is completely burnt off these trees. Foliage is dropping. Branches are dying off on the trees. The trees in Redding don't look good. And this is not just a drought-related issue. And I've been in the field with USDA soil scientists measuring also soil pH changes. And this is another arena where we know this contamination is happening. We're seeing pH changes of 10 to 12 times toward alkaline from established USDA soil baseline studies. So again, one more source of confirmation that this contamination is indeed there. 
Trees in Reading, again, I, I, when I moved here 12 years ago, the trees looked outstanding in this city. Now they look quite horrific and getting worse by the day. And this is exactly what would be the known and expected effect with extensive UV damage. Geoengineering causing drought. All of us know we're being droughted out. For 10 years, I've said, because the science says so, that the more they aerosolize, the less it will rain here, period. So again, we have yet one more confirmation of when they spray upstream in our storm track, it diminishes and disperses our rain. Mr. Wigany, I'm going to ask a question. How yes. much time did we uh, have scheduled for? OK, has that already passed? No, that was a 10 minute beeper. So, so let's do this. How much more time do you think? 30 seconds. OK, very good. We want seconds. you to be able to, to Thank conclude. You, Thank, you. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Noah already deciding that we're not going to get rain from El Nino, which is astounding that they would know that so quickly. Another satellite photo, and, it, and this is hard to see on this screen, but the entire, we, people can view this at geoengineeringwatch.org, the entire Pacific is covered with grid patterns in this shot. It's hard to see. Prevalence of Alzheimer's disease going off the charts. Autism, 10,000% increase, known connection with aluminum, same with Alzheimer's and, and uh, dementia. Alzheimer's and autism, the common link, aluminum exposure. Last slide, the right to know. That's all we're asking. The public has a right to know there's a public health hazard in regards to the heavy metal contamination and the UV radiation. That's all we're asking is for that disclosure. Thank you for the extra time. Thank you for addressing it. Out of respect to the supervisors, they're, they're showing great courtesy that no other board has had the courage to do yet. So let's, let's give them all the respect they deserve. Well, Mr. Really can... before, we, before we move on to the scheduled additional presenters at three minutes apiece, and I'm going to just ask in advance as you come up that you, we're going to hold you to that three minutes. They know that. I, I do want to ask this board before, because you're our main presenter today, if there are any additional questions at this time from this board. Okay. So, so I have just two questions and I'd like to ask you, and please excuse this. This is not meant in any other way but out of complete respect. Um, could you just really concisely, what do you believe the purpose of this engineered spraying is? I, will tell I mean this in all sincerity. What, what do you say I, I, the purpose of it is? I can tell you what the stated purpose is by governmental document and thank, U.S. tax. Yeah, right into yeah. that mic there. I, I can you. tell you what the stated purpose is, solar radiation management, SRM, to block the sun. That's the stated purpose. The, the consequences don't seem to be considered with these programs, but that is the stated purpose on almost all UN and global governance documents for these programs. Okay, and, and obviously you presented a great deal of material to, to myself and to other board members over the years, and that is the conclusion drawn. I just wanted to draw that out today because I didn't hear that specific language, so I wanted to make sure we state that. But then on a personal level, I have another question, and I've asked many people, and no one's been able to answer this question for me, so I mean this in all sincerity. Why does the spring create a drought in California and flooding in the Mideast, or the Midwest. Thank you for asking that question. Yes, thank you. I appreciate it. When you aerosolize the storm track, and the science backs up what I'm saying word for word, you diminish and disperse the rain. This is not seeding to create rain. This is seeding to create artificial cloud cover. And mm -hmm. because there's too many condensation nuclei, it tends to disperse that moisture exactly as we've seen over California again and again. Back to my, my talk in front of the California Energy Commission, they recognized this fact I spoke to their top scientist. When you have too many particles in the air, it diminishes rain. It does not augment it if those particles are too small. So it tends to migrate moisture from one place to another, creating drought and deluge. And this is very well documented from ma every major science institution, from MIT, Scientific American. These effects are known. So it's not a uniform effect. It tends to disrupt the hydrological cycle completely. So when you spray upstream in the storm track, it tends to migrate that moisture somewhere else where it comes down in a deluge. And that's exactly what we see. Mr. Wigginton, thank you very much. Thank you, I appreciate Les. that. Thank you. Uh, don't go away. Don't. <laughs> Folks, I know your encouragement and your passion, but we have other requests to speak, and we're going to kind of be here all day if, if we... Mr. Wigginton, if you'd come back again, please. We're not, we're not through with you yet. Supervisor Chappelle. <laughs> Thank you, Chairman Baugh. You're welcome. Uh, Mr. Wigginson, I just I've had one statement here, and, and I want to see if you confirm that. Uh, 
in, in your belief of following through with this and trying to get situations resolved, is it because it is a public health hazard? Is that one of your number one concerns that this must be disclosed? That is our request of the board because that is why these programs can go on and on and on because media will not cover it until the actual effects are made known. And this contamination issue, again, is absolutely verifiable. Same with the UV issue. We can meter it for you. We have state-of-the-art meters. So, and we have corroboration from other science studies. So yes, that is the request of the board. We fully recognize the board has no power to deal with this issue, nor does CARB, uh, nor other state agencies. But the contamination issue is a public health hazard, and we believe that disclosure is necessary, required, and that's all we're asking is disclosure of the, the heavy metal contamination and the UV issue. That's, that's what we're asking for, yes. Thank you, very good. Thank Any you. other questions from the board of Mr. Wigington at this time? Mr. Wigington, thank you very much for the presentation. And then I'll ask of Supervisor Giacomini, do you have the order or do we want to go to Mr. Supervisor Modi? My gratitude to all of you. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you, sir. Leonard, you, everybody very on very the good. Okay. So the rest of the agreed upon presentations, uh, they are going to be called out uh, in advance. And then Supervisor Modi is going to move to those who submitted requests today as well to speak. Thank you, Supervisor. You know, and maybe I can suggest one other way to uh, show your support of the speakers, but at the same time allow us to proceed. I did this one time before and it worked very well. Rather than um, yelling or clapping, perhaps if you just choose to raise your hands, that will show us that you support the speaker, but it also will show, as I hope you, I think, I'm sure you plan to do, is to, is to show, you know, show the support to the media. So maybe that, oh, so maybe that might be one way to get You're getting it. some love, Supervisor Modi. I saw some hands out there. So, perfect. So the next speaker is Rosalind Peterson, followed by Alan Buckman. Hello, my name is Iraja Sivadas. Rosalind Peterson of USDA was not able to make it today, and um, <clears throat> and Dane Wington asked me if I could fill in for her. Um, as I said, my name is Iraja Sivadas. I'm um, <clears throat> welcome. Thank you. Uh, I'm a disabled combat veteran. It's the longest I've stood up in a long time. I really appreciate that you uh, are taking time to listen to us today. Um, <clears throat> I am a, um, <clears throat> an instructor of mathematics at Shasta College and a member of the uh, Union for Concerned Scientists. And uh, this will be very short. I have a very short talk. Um, there's just two main points that I'd like to make. One is that... Um, Aircraft making a condensation trail is very similar in many ways to when you go outside on a cold day and exhale, you create a condensation trail. That little cloud is a condensation trail. Now, if you take a two mile walk on a cold day and you can turn around and you can see your condensation trail tracking all the way back for two miles, that's the kind of idiocy, idiocy, excuse me, um, that's how crazy it is to think that what we're looking in the sky is actually condensation trails when they travel from, uh, from horizon to horizon. Uh, the second point is <laughs> there's a huge amount of uh, aluminum being found because these sprays have aluminum, strontium, barium, manganese, and uh, there's a lot of argument that aluminum is very common to be found, but aluminum is only common in a bonded form. It's not common in a free form and we're finding high rates of free aluminum uh, in the soil which is not natural. Um, so thank you again for listening to us. Appreciate it. Thank you Mr. Sivadas. Uh, Alan, Alan Buckman followed by Francis Mangles. One quick comment was Rosalind was really sorry she couldn't make it today. Her mother fell and broke her wrist, and so she has to take care of some hospital duties. Um, anyway, I'm Alan Buckman. Uh, I was a weatherman in the United States Air Force. I uh, was a wildlife bio biologist with the Department of Fish and Wildlife for 38 years. I have a lot of experience, uh, field experience. I've been studying the cloud situation and, uh, and doing research for the last uh, 12 years. Um, 
our air and our natural resources, I want to tell you that we're in very great danger from the pollution that's coming down over us. And we've been led astray by the military industrial complex, and they're responsible for the clouds creation and weather manipulation programs. They're dark operations. That's why they're not out in the media. Now, I'm here to give you testimony that uh, contrails, chemtrails, they're not contrails, are indeed real. They're spraying almost every day. I sit out with my, my uh, wolf dogs in the afternoon and I watch the clouds and watch the spraying program going on. Um, we have clouds in the sky we've never seen before. Almost every day I'm seeing clouds I've never seen before. And NASA has been even named a few of these new clouds. Uh, it's, it's really interesting, but NASA is a corporation. I want you to know that. Um, we were warned about the takeover of our freedoms by the military industrial complex by both Eisenhower and Kennedy. And Eisenhower in his parting comments, and then, and then Kennedy uh, later. Um, I think it's obvious now with the Citizens United and McCutcheon rulings that they're gaining traction on us, folks. We're, we are in trouble more than just a spraying program. Um, the metal compounds that are being used are environmentally dangerous. We need to be monitoring them. We need to be testing them. And because our, our previous inquiries have gone nowhere, I really appreciate the opportunity to, to speak with you and hope that we can find some testing program um, by certified testing laboratories to actually measure these effects, and so we have a basis on which we can protest, you can protest, if your concerns match mine. And believe me, I'm seriously concerned with, by watch, with what I'm watching. As a wildlife biologist, I've been watching the ecosystem collapse. When you lose all your stream organisms, when you have aluminum overload in your streams, you're killing your microbial bacteria, and you're disrupting the entire ecosystem. So it goes way beyond just a little bit of pollution. Um, how did Monsanto know to create aluminum-resistant plants? I don't think I've heard anybody ask that question. Okay. So um, what I'd like to suggest to you... So that would be it, your notice to draw to a conclusion, please. Yes, sir, I was just going to do that. I would like to ask you to put a little bit of funding towards some real testing programs of snow and rain and vegetation. Now, I've tested lichens and found very high levels in the lichens, and they get all of their nutrients from the air and the rain. So it's a good guideline, and I think you would, you would find out a lot of things Thank to you, help Mr. support this. Francis Mangalis, followed by Jeff Nelson. Welcome. Greetings, gentlemen. Thank you for the opportunity. I'm a retired scientist, bachelor's cum laude in forestry, master's in zoology, 35 years, USDA scientist, soil conservation service, U.S. Forest Service, civil service equivalents in range, wildlife, fisheries, geology, agriculture, soils, ornithology, entomology, botany, of mycology, hydrology. Am I qualified to speak? <laughs> Just letting you know it. Okay, these previous guys... I've watched exactly what they do, and yes, they are correct. I've seen exactly the same stuff, so ditto marks on those. Insects. I've done studies in Siskiyou County. They're at 20% of normal. The aquatic insects ma basically made a nosedive in 2006 to about 20% of normal. So far this year, I've sampled 200 trout stomachs. 98% of them are empty. So uh, sorry about the trout fishing, fellows. The mayflies, stoneflies, dipteris, and caddisflies are uh, damn near gone, except in the areas where they're spring. I'm going to remind you to address the Board of Supervisors, please. The terrestrial sampling is down to about 20% of normal, except for pest species like ants. Uh, we're seeing a loss of the major bird species, and as the gentleman said, the ecosystem is unraveling, and Audubon's been telling you that for years. You want some figures? Okay, latest water test, tested the rain. 13,100 micrograms per liter of aluminum in the rain in 2013. Normally, it should be zero. So 13,100 is pretty damn much, folks. It used to be zero. Then it was 100s in the 2000s. 
and then in uh, since 2010 it's into the 1000s and the latest 13,100. In the snow on Mount Shasta, pristine Mount Shasta, 61,000 feet, no, excuse me, 8,000 foot level, 61,000 micrograms per liter, four times the amount that is found in the soil up there. Where in the hell is this stuff coming from if it's not coming from the soil? Um, now, normal, again, it's, uh, you know, these tests are international in scope. We're seeing this all over the world, guys. Okay, pH of acid soils is 20 times more alkaline. The aluminum in the soil has doubled in the last 10 years. The rain normal was 5.6, it's 20 times more alkaline. Aluminum blocks essential nutrients. I am unable in my garden to restore normal pH, and that's because nanoparticles are now in the circulatory systems of both plants and humans. So welcome, fellow guinea pigs. Uh, the collapse and decrease of agriculture is something I worry about even more than the previous info about autism and Alzheimer's. Just about there, okay. See my paper, Geoengineering What We Know. The latest update is 71114. It's available, and nobody has been able to correct it or debunk it for five years. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Manglis. Jeff Nelson, followed by Russ Lazuka. Good uh, morning. Uh, as you can see, I was an uh, airline pilot. And uh, the nine years as an uh, instructor, uh, last seven as a lead instructor at the uh, largest flight academy in uh, the world. Uh, part of that job was teaching all these pilots about engines and uh, weather. Um, oh, the pink here is uh, left over from the 4th of July. It was supposed to be red, gray, and blue. And the red did not go away, it turned pink. <laughs> anyway, um, make it short, sweet, and simple. Um, jet engine is very simple. It's, uh, it sucks, um, it compresses, it bangs, and it blows. And so what happens is these turbines suck the air in, increasing the amount of density of the air. It goes into a, ch a combustion chamber where it's uh, heated and expands again, comes out, as thrust at a very high temperature, similar to when you blow up a balloon, you let the balloon go and it goes straight, you know, flying off. Now, when that hot air ex exits the tailpipe, uh, this occurs, uh, the contrails, not the chemical, the contrails occur because of cold air, minus 30. It takes a high altitude, around 30,000 feet plus, and that air turns to, there's a carbon dioxide, and water vapor in that exhaust. That turns to ice crystals, and that's what you see, the white stream behind it. Those white crystals uh, of ice um, um, warm up, dissolve, and the smoke goes away. And it never lasts more than a minute. Usually it's in seconds, depending on outside air conditions. What we're seeing now, and I first could not believe it, and I started looking at the skies, and these are not normal, they're not natural. There's something going on. I don't know who it is or why they're doing it. All I can testify is it's not natural and it's not normal. It's got to be some outside influence doing that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Nelson. Russ Lazuka followed by Hamid Rabis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and board members. Rabi is the last name. Hamid, Hamid first name. I'm sorry. That yeah, that's fine. Right. I, I heard something yes, similar to my name that was close enough. I'm a neurologist practicing in Reading for 17 years. And in the past five years, I've seen the number of patients with Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's, and other neurodegenerative diseases tremendously increase, almost quadruple. Why is the reason for that? I don't have enough knowledge and data to uh, draw a conclusion. And basically, even no one center, even university-based center, can come to a firm conclusion for the reason for that. But the explanation that they provide to us that the reason for increased number of these patients is because 
of increase in the population of aging people. It means that people are getting old, older and stay alive because of progress of medicine, and that causes the uh, dementia uh, to surface up, does not seem very convincing. Almost is like saying that uh, dementia is like this and an act of God. On the other hand, we do know that we have a trend. We have a trend of thought for a long time that we make a mistake and we jump into a very simple, the most simple or a straightforward, fixed it at any price solution. And it seems like this is the scenario is playing at the present time. There are many activities that uh, are reported. We hear bits and pieces, but we don't really have the whole result from it. And we do need to put the burden of proof on those who have the authority and have access to the data or the activities that are happening all over. We know that there are a small group of experts, scientists, that their conflict or lack of conflict of interest is not very clear to us. Basically have the eyes and ears of those in power in the government, and they are circulating the idea of this so-called quick fix for environmental calamities that has happened. And that is what is basically geoengineering. They provide solutions basically, as you heard, to spray nanoparticles, very small particles, uh, to basically reflect the uh, dangerous uh, irradiation from the space. So that would be your notice to draw to a conclusion? Okay, so what I'm getting to conclusion is that these nanoparticles, they basically trigger a programmed cell death in the brain, and that is the ultimate path we see in Alzheimer's. Thank you, Mr. Ruiz. Russ Lazuka followed by Fred Meyer. Thank you, board, for hearing me today. My name is Russ Lazuka, Shasta County resident, 20 years, U U.S. Air Force veteran, 17 years of aviation experience, and 15 years as a commercial pilot uh, to include Delta Airlines. That being stated, I have witnessed various weather phenomena. Additional education pertinent to this issue, I'm a certified arborist, contracted, uh, was contracted to PG&E, and later as a supervisor with Aspen Tree Service. My primary job was to advise clients of hazard tree situations, meaning dying trees and removal of same. Humans in many ways react to outside environmental elements very similar as do plants. One example is uh, absorption, and they are today in declining nature of respiratory failure. Lack of water and absorption of toxic chemicals are the main killers along with very high UV. Commercial aircraft are assigned a code, a radar identification, called a squawk. They are assigned altitudes and airways like highways in the sky. Contracted tankers, that is civilians like Evergreen, flying for the purpose of weather modification will not have a squawk code, nor will they be on an assigned airway. They will also be on military radio channels. Commercial air traffic control will not be able to inform commercial pilots of approximate aircraft. Therefore, you look up and you see all these grid and crisscross patterns of aerosol in the sky, and there are no passengers on board. Those trails, if they are true condensation trails, will completely dissipate within 15 seconds. A statement issued by the United States Air Force that contrails become visible roughly about a wingspan behind an aircraft. A Boeing 757 has a wingspan of about 125 feet. That means behind the engines of that aircraft, you'll see a chemtrail of 125 feet that will quickly dissipate. Evergreen uh, Aviation admits the weather modification spraying. I got a patent number here. They call them chem bombs. Got a beautiful picture that you can go online and find. Tons of aerosol can be released in a line up to 250 miles or in huge clusters. That's when you see the interruptions in the sky of uh, batches of artificial cirrus clouds. However, behind an aerosol spraying aircraft, they stream, persist, and according to the winds aloft, will dissipate only after hours of lingering. 
because the chemicals are falling out of the sky onto the planet. I will close with this. No one has to be, have prescience to become informed. It's there, look up, look around. There are no contiguous states, nor Alaska, or Hawaii, nor the future state of Jefferson, or any other continent <laughs> who is impervious to the aerosol chemicals and contaminant particulates purposely sprayed in our stratosphere. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lazuka. Fred Meyer, followed by Mark McCandish. Hi, I'm not Fred Myers, but I'm stepping in for him. I'm Dr. Frank Lavolsi. I've been in the community since 1980. Um, it's good to see you, Dr. Lavolsi. Good to see you, too. Thank you for holding this meeting. Uh, I became interested in chemtrails about eight years ago when I was in Hawaii, and the Hawaiians are really being very vocal about it. Uh, every place I've gone in the world now, and most recently Quebec and Prince Edward Island, Nova Scotia, Maine, and Massachusetts, they're all over the place. I'm also a pilot, and I've flown into Travis Air Force Base on several occasions. There's a whole area designated to replenishing these planes that fly and drop this chemical on us. It's totally guarded. The people that are loading these planes with the chemicals are dressed in complete hazmat outfits. So if this is not harmful, why are they in a complete hazmat outfit? For those of you who don't know what a hazmat outfit, it looks like a spacesuit. So they're wearing this and we're not. As a doctor, I can tell you there's been about a 25% increase in lung problems in this area and in most areas that they're spraying. Secondly, I concur about the increase in number of Alzheimer's. They have since been able to take the aluminum and micronize it, which means it'll stay up longer. But it also means, and I don't know if any of you have noticed some metallic taste in your mouth when they're spraying, but you inhale that, it goes up through your cribriform plate and into your, through your sinuses, and into the brain. If you remember eight to 10 years ago, there was this big move to get rid of aluminum from underarm deodorant because it would cause Alzheimer's. <laughs> Look what they're doing to us now. Um, any agency I've called, I've been stonewalled. Oh, this is being put on by the UN. Now, since when does the UN have airspace activity over the United States of America or also over any other country for that matter? And if, if that's the case, who's paying for it? And I bet you the taxpayer is paying for it. <laughs> so all I can say is it's about time we get up in arms about this because it is affecting our health. I look around and I see people are starting to look up and see this. Many times I've spoken about air <laughs> chemtrails and I get this blank look on my face. What are you talking about? I'm saying, look up. As a pilot, but before I fly, I look up. And so, boy, they're really out there working. I really thank you for this opportunity to speak, but it's high time that we as citizens of this great country take action. Thank you, Dr. Lavalsi. Mark McCandish, followed by Arendale Spindeleus. Thank you very much for this opportunity. I came here um, mostly as a person who's worked in the military industrial complex, worked on F-106s in the Air Force, had a secret clearance, worked as a uh, consultant to a variety of the top aerospace companies as a conceptual artist and a designer. I've had uh, a secret clearance for a number of years and I've worked on systems that are still classified today, 20 years later. Um, I want to give you a little bit of history on the background behind nanoparticles has been described before. A nanometer is one billionth of a meter. It's very small. In fact, if you have particles, say, that are 40 or 50 nanometers across, you can take and line 50 of them up next to a single red blood cell. These things are extremely tiny. They're pervasive. The manufacturing processes, there's probably five or six different ones that I know of. There's probably others. 
But the explosion of nanotechnology has grown since the late 1980s, early 1990s, and is now growing exponentially. If you've ever seen or heard of a grain silo explosion, where particles of grain grind against one another, produce a dust, and then one spark will set it all off in an explosion. This is kind of exemplary of what nanoparticles represents in terms of the impact that they have on the environment. Because you can spread so many small little particles through the environment, it dramatically increases the surface area that's in that environment because there's so many of them. When you look up at the sun and you see a white haze, that is aluminum floating in the air right now, and it's coming from the aircraft. Now, as it happens, the Air Force conducted a study starting in 1993. It was called In Vitro Toxicity of Aluminum Nanoparticles in Rat Alveolar Macrophages. That's a real fancy way of saying testing the effect of aluminum nanoparticles on the white blood cells in the little air sacs in your lung, the alveoli. And what they found in this eight-year study was that these particles, when you're exposed to them long enough, it suppresses the ability of your white blood cells to defend you from airborne infections coming into your lungs. So it suppresses your immune system. But they also found that these same particles, once they get into your system, they can actually go through the barrier in each one of the cells. They get inside the cells, and these particles can actually suppress the ability of mitochondria which are in the cells that help to gobble up toxins and things that would be harmful to the nucleus and the, the reproduction process of the cells in your body. These processes are suppressed, and so essentially by breathing this material in, your immune system is dramatically suppressed. Now, in addition to this, the materials that are going into the environment right now, aluminum oxide nanoparticles and barium nanoparticles, these just happen to be the same materials that they use in nanothermate explosives. And so when this stuff settles down out of the air into the environment, it is small enough to be absorbed through the root structure of the trees in the forest. And so when there's a forest fire, and there will be a forest fire, those fires burn dramatically hotter. The example out here in Ono is just one example. Oh, wow, that was fast. It goes by fast, doesn't yes. it? So anyway, the we'll point is the, po the point is that the, the the cost of firefighting, the cost in the, in the healthcare system, have nearly doubled in the last 10 years. The amount of acreage is lost because of fires. The impact on human health is dramatic, and, and it's well documented. So. Uh, in fact, in closing, I want to say that uh, NASA has also uh, conducted a research program in what they call metallized fuels. We're actually putting aluminum oxide right in the fuel because it has two atoms of aluminum and three atoms of oxygen. So during the combustion process, it releases all that oxygen and dramatically increases efficiency, but it leaves the aluminum in the air. Thank you, Mr. Candice. You're welcome. Arendelle Spindeleus, followed by Kim Moore. Is Arendelle here? Good morning. I guess I'm a substitute. I'm Dr. Steve Davis. I'm a practicing chiropractor, naturopath here in the community. Been here for almost 30 years. And the uh, unfortunate thing is, is that I started out in this healthcare practice. I actually got my undergraduate work over at Humboldt State. In Humboldt State, we had a bunch of hippies that hugged trees. And then what we're doing was worried about the environment. We created this thing called the Environmental Protection Agency. And then from that, we're looking at the air, food, and water. Air, food, and water is related to the particles, the chemicals, and substances. We have agencies, federal agencies, state agencies, local agencies, whose job is, is to try to protect us from all this. Then what happened is that we have industries that have tried to come into our community here. They do not stay or do not come because the EPA won't allow them because of what they're going to release from ground up. We got things coming from sky down, and it's a huge, huge problem. Because as it comes down, what happens is a couple of things. Is that it actually is in our air, we breathe it. And as we breathe it, it's actually gonna go up through our nostrils, into our brain, easiest access to our brain frontal lobe. The contaminants that are in, that have been identified, which already been mentioned, are aluminum. Aluminum is the number one neural uh, free radical generator to the brain to cause early apoptosis, which is early death of brain, and it begins to set off the scar tissue, which we call the amygdalin, which is, a pot, which is part of the uh, chemical matrix related to Alzheimer's. That's problem number one, because when we look at the Alzheimer issue, we say those are the old. The real problem is, and the real scare I have, is as I am a father of two, I am a grandfather of three, my youngest one will be getting married next August, or this August, Hopefully she will um, be able to spawn and have some children of her own and then we'll have more 
So the whole process is, is that in what we have going on is our children, when they're playing outside, your emblem says, come, come to the North State, enjoy us, enjoy the mountains, the streams, the fish, etc. Come to us and bring your resources and your money, and children go outside and play. In the last five years, I do alternative medicine, which means we're looking for those things. I was part of the early group that was looking for aluminum in ADD and ADHD. And all of those children that started to develop those phenomena had high levels of aluminum. When we figured out protocols to detox them out, to free the body of those particular contaminants, what happened is that their brains came back. When we do this to the age, it doesn't come back as quick, but it will come back. But I'm seeing Alzheimer's in 56 years old. Back in the 70s, Alzheimer's when you were 80. So the drama is, is our children. ADD started in the 70s. Autism was not on the radar. There was no documents, there was no information. It was one in 100,000 children. Today, what we have is one in 48 boys. Boys play outside all day as a kid. When I was a little boy, I was outside all day long. And the, and the unfortunate thing is, is that moms now, when I do my testing... Uh, draw it to conclusion sound, thank you. Okay, when I do my testing, and we do hair analysis and other mineral analysis, we see these things. The thing that's most disturbing to me is aluminum, cadmium, barium. Barium substitutes for calcium. Calcium makes strong bones. Uh, cadmium is a known carcinogen. It's actually in Prop 65 in the list, a known carcinogen. So what we have is this. We have environmental contaminants. We have been aware of this since the 60s. Now we've got seen an onslaught. We need to have some kind of way to warn moms, keep their kids from going outside. Thank you, doctor. One question for you. Are you also a neuro neurologist as well? No, I'm not, sorry. Okay, just want to clarify, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Board of Supervisors. I'm Joe Marmon from Sacramento, an Welcome. attorney. And um, back in May 6th of 2011, I called your Shasta Air County Air Pollution Control Officers, Russ Mole and Ross Bell, asked them how come Shasta County is getting sprayed like crazy with this geoengineering chemtrails? And they said, we don't know anything about it. I said, why don't you look into it? There was no answer. I wrote to them and I explained in a two-page letter what was going on with this geoengineering spraying and I got no answer from them. In that letter, I discussed the contaminants in air, water, and the snow that are out outrageous levels that should never be happening. It was an illegal contamination. I offered to meet with them. I suggested that I would volunteer to sue Shasta County residents to sue Shasta County for failing to act to protect the citizens and failure to enforce air quality laws. I still got no answer. Uh, July 12, 2012, I wrote to the federal government, uh, Leon Panetta, Secretary of Defense, <coughs> James Miller, Under Secretary of Defense for the Army Policy, and General Norton Schwartz, Air Force Chief of Staff, because Air Force wrote a book and on the first page of the book, they say, we're gonna control the weather by the year 2025. I asked them, what are they doing spraying this, these chemicals on the public? I said, there's a violation of United States Code 50 USC 1520, which prohibits the American government from experimenting on the US citizens with chemical agents. I said that law also requires the who's ever experimenting when the federal government does it that they have to report to Congress within 30 days. They wrote back, they said they don't know what I'm talking about. They, we have enough evidence that there's a spraying going all, all over the place. Um, they still denied any knowledge of geochemical engineering weather warfare. They also denied having any information with my freedom of information requests. I personally tested uh, water and aluminum and I found aluminum had 47 times the normal expected remount, amounts, uh, strontium had 10 to 20 times the amounts, barium was 20 times. This is what the stuff looks like here. I collected, it looks, most people just think it's a cobweb, but I tested it, it has outrageous amounts of barium, strontium, and aluminum, but they destroy the sample, so I'm not letting this get away from me. I'm just requesting that the Board of Supervisors be strong and courageous like the Board of Supervisors in Suffolk County, New York. They outlawed geochemical engineering. Hawaii passed an ordinance against uh, prohibiting geochemical engineering. I urge you to bar geoengineering in Shasta County and pass an ordinance. At least ask some damn questions. What the hell is all this aluminum doing here? Why are the trees dying? Fish is dying? Why is there Alzheimer and aluminum spiking? And why are these fibers on the ground here in Chasta County? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Marmon.
Let me make some general observations and then a couple of specific ones. Today, the Shasta County Board of Supervisors has been the beneficiary of some sincere, passionate, and knowledgeable comments. And I thank you for those. I specifically want to call to your attention the outstanding work that is being done on this issue by Mr. Dane Wigington and Ms. Kathy Kresser. I, I, they've done a wonderful job. Uh, I, I think your comments outlining what the AQMD can do and can't do are valid. And I think the board has to be mindful about those. But I will tell you, especially in the arena of the US EPA, I am disappointed in that, uh, let me finish please before you all, you might want to take your hands down. I am disappointed because there was a man running for US Congress that said he's one of us. Is his representative here today? Did you see his representative here today? I did not. And I think it would have been productive and helpful had his representative, LaMalfa's representative, been here today to listen to this heartfelt testimony. I am in agreement with my colleagues about sending letters and a call for action, but I would hope that we could go a step further in that. And, and you tell me, Mr. Lees, if this is possible, uh, which I think it is, I would like for us to send a copy of this video where all of you spoke today, all two and a half or three hours of this testimony, I would like that video to be sent to our senators and our U.S. representatives we'll and, also, and also our representatives in the state of California. We'll do that. Let them listen to the passion that came out of this meeting today. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Kehoe. <laughs> Supervisor Giacomini. Well said, I would so move. Second? Uh, Leonard, second, and then, second? Under, <laughs> then under discussion, Mr. Right. Lees. Like May I just ask for a clarification of the motion? Uh, certainly, <laughs> <laughs> certainly. <clears throat> that we gather the information from the park, so we have some, hopefully some data. Okay. So that's the first thing on the list, I believe. Okay. Then we compile information that we heard today in a succinct letter along with that information, send it to all the representatives that David has outlined, as well as those agencies, Cal EPA, US EPA, California Air Board, and perhaps the Department of Transportation, like Rick mentioned, um, along with a video of the hearing today. Is that good? That, yeah, that's, that's good. Thank you. So, you want to second? Do you want to re second? Do, do we have a second to that already? We have a second. You're second. Well, I second it, but I'll withdraw, Mr. That? Modi, if you'd like to you second want, it. I, I just have a comment, okay. so go ahead. Okay. So, do you want to confirm? Yes. A second. Thank you, Mr. Modi. Yeah, I just want to know if part of that is we, we also asked um, Mr. Simon to go find out what he can. We talked about, you mentioned about Lassen Park, but I mean, what we can do as far as measurements and those kind of things, not that we're asking you to do them, but just find out what that process would, would that be part of the... Yes, perfect. You can add that. Add David, that. do you agree? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I have one other question of Mr. Lees. Mr. Lees, should anyone in the audience wish to get a copy of this uh, video, how can they go about doing that? There's a couple of ways to do it. The easiest and most effective way, in my opinion, is to go online. Uh, within a, an hour or two, you'll be able to watch this entire meeting at any place you want to. You don't have to sit there and watch the whole three hours or four hours, but you could actually pick out different portions. So you can actually go on the Shasta County website, go online, and uh, watch any one of our Board of Supervisor meetings. And it should be ready to go, certainly, within the next two or three hours. This is a little longer, so I'm giving myself a little bit of time. So. Thank you, Mr. Lee. Supervisor Modi? 
Yeah, I just wanted to, I, I think we're going to take a vote here in a second. I wanted to add one more thing on our discussion. I, I also wanted to personally thank Mr. Wigington for um, your efforts here today. Um, I, I thought that you put together a very well thought out presentation. And um, I can tell you that I, I sat down and watched an hour and um, 